Hey, good morning, church. Praise the Lord. You all happy to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. amen. Got an amen out of that one anyway. Uh, I shared with you all when Angela and I went to Israel that that trip was a pastor familiarization trip. In other words, all of us as pastors and pastor's wives went over to the Holy Land uh, to become familiar with the train, with the territory, uh, to become familiar with the food, uh, to become familiar with the uh, a, a amount of uh, athleticism required to be able to go on that trip and to go on that journey. But in the midst of that, I also told y'all that that was uh, us going over there to prepare to bring, bring the church, okay? Uh, since we've come back, I shared with y'all that uh, I have two other brothers in Christ, Brother Sean Edwards and uh, Brother Brent Boatwright. Uh, the three of us have gathered together, uh, Brent pastors down in Temple, Sean pastors up in uh, North Richland Hills, and I pastor here, obviously. So we are covering a wide range of territory in our churches to open up a Holy Land experience for you. Uh, you will see out there in the foyer, I have these brochures out there now. And inside these brochures is also uh, a paperwork to fill out if you desire to go on a Holy Land tour. The dates that we set aside for this is March 4th through 13th, 2020. 24. So that's a long ways off, it seems like. But when you're considering preparing financially and physically for a trip like this, that's not that far off, okay? Um, and so we're bringing this information to you. We're giving you the opportunity to go on the same journey that we went on. If you sign up early, there's a $150 discount off the price. If you sign up a little later than early, there's $100 off, and it decreases down from there. Uh, ultimately, it's a trip of a lifetime, an experience of a lifetime. And just to kind of re familiarize yourself with it again, John's going to play a quick video. It'll last about two and a half minutes.
quite all right. So that's just kind of a preview of the trip. As you noticed in that preview, uh, there's a lot of steps, uh, a lot of uh, terrain. Uh, the interesting thing about Israel is it's always under excavation. Uh, it's always, they're always finding new things. As a matter of fact, while we were there, we went to three different sites on that trip where they were actively doing excavations and have had authenticated uh, the materials and stuff that they had found. And literally two weeks after we got back from there, it became public news in the media that the things that we were literally watching them work on were, were had been authenticated and were now evidence to the first church. Amen? Amen? So it's an opportunity for you. It's something I would highly encourage you to pray about. Um, and I will say this. On the front end, Brent, Sean, and I have agreed that it's open to our churches and our immediate family. Now, uh, we have a requirement to fulfill 48 spaces in order to get the pricing that we get. Now, if we don't fill those 48 spaces, or it looks like we're not going to be able to fill those 48 spaces, then we'll open it up a little bit wider so that we're able to fulfill those, those requirements so that everybody can get it at the cost that, that uh, it's offered at. If you have any questions about that, let me know. And this is not the first time, that, or the only time that you'll hear about it over the next 17 months, okay? All right, with that said, uh, we're going to enter into a new sermon series today. We're going to enter into the Gospel of John, and I am incredibly excited to enter into this book. Today's sermon is going to be really not a sermon. Today's sermon is going to be just uh, information, providing a, a foundation for us to begin this sermon series on. It's just going to be an introductory lecture, basically, into uh, who John is, uh, the purpose of John's gospel, and then ultimately uh, how we can apply that into our own lives. Uh, I was actually surprised that as much as we reference John, as much as we talk about John, as often as we evangelize people and, and tell them uh, when we give them a Bible, go to the book of John, and even a lot of times we open it for them and put a, a bookmark in there so they know where the Gospel of John is to, to give them the opportunity to then read. Uh, the reason we do that is, is because John lays out uh, the most clearest of anybody, I believe, uh, just what it means to become a believer in Jesus Christ and then ultimately to continue to follow in Christ. So I'm incredibly excited about it. I pray that you will be too. Uh, we're going to take this uh, book and we're going to go all the way through it like we did the book of Acts. Uh, of course, there's going to be some interruptions along the way. We'll, we'll have several different pauses for uh, different events and stuff like that. But uh, suffice it to say... We will get through this book at some time, okay? Uh, there's not a deadline on when we get done. With that said, uh, today we're going to be reading out of John chapter 20. We're going to be looking at verses 30 and 31, and that's going to set us up uh, for, for what we're going to look at today. So if you don't mind, stand in honor of God's Word. John chapter 20 as always, out of the English Standard Version, has these words for us. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. Verse 31. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, excuse me, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Our Heavenly Father God, I praise your holy name. I thank you for the church that's gathered in this campus today, and I thank you that uh, together we can indulge ourselves in your word. Father, I pray that you stand me behind the cross, uh, that your will would be done here in the presence of, of all of us. Lord, and I pray for those that 
do not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that today would be the last day of their life that they ever live without Jesus. Father, I thank you and I give you the glory for all things and I ask this in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Spirit we pray. And all God's people said? Amen. 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 So, when we think about the Bible, we think about the Bible and we think about all of the different books of the Bible and everybody generally has a favorite scripture or a favorite text or you know, a favorite book, maybe even a favorite character uh, out of the Bible. All of us have something in the Bible that's just our kind of our, our little golden nugget that we really cling to. Uh, and, and, and interestingly enough, with that said, when I was researching all of my sermons that I've preached over the years and all the different places that I've preached, I have literally only preached five sermons out of the book of John the entire time that I've been preaching. Only five sermons. And that blew me away because it seemed like I had preached a whole series out of this book somewhere or taught a whole series out of this book somewhere. And so I'm going through flash drives after flash drive trying to find where all these sermons are, where all these Bible studies are, only to find out that they don't exist. And so then I started thinking, how did I come to the conclusion that I had preached out of this book? The only answer that I could come up with is I must have dreamed it. And it, and it, and it must have been Jesus letting me know you haven't done this yet, so now we're going to do this. Uh, but anyway, John is a beautiful, beautiful book. So we're going to look at a few different points here. The first point is this. Who is John? John is an apostle of Jesus Christ. Uh, John sits in the back corner of the room, but that's not the apostle Jesus Christ. Uh, but John is an apostle of Jesus Christ. Uh, he's a disciple of Jesus uh, he was uh, one of the first disciples. Not only that, uh, is, is John, as we see in our scriptures, as John goes along, John becomes one of Jesus' inner circle. His, his, his main, one of his main three. As a matter of fact, we see uh, in the Gospels a couple of different times that John is reclining against the bosom of Jesus. Now here's the thing. Uh, you don't let somebody that's not close to you recline up against you, right? Uh, only people that are close to you, only people that you have a strong connection with, do you let them recline against you. And so uh, John was a, a very good friend of Jesus, and Jesus a, a very good friend of John. And and so they, so they, 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 they did ministry together. But with that said, I'm going to ask you: Has anybody seen that new movie, Maverick Top Gun? Okay, good. A few of you have. For the rest of you, it's going to be a spoiler. Okay. <laughs> um, in the movie Top Gun, uh, Maverick Top Gun, uh, Tom Cruise, who is the main character in the movie, well. His helmet on his on his flight helmet says Maverick, hence the word Maverick Top Gun. Okay, but it fits him well in the movie in the movie because he's always going against the grain of, of what everybody wants. So much so that he's called back to the Top Gun uh, school to to train some pilots. They feel like he's the only one that has the ability to train these pilots and. He gets there, and, and ultimately some things happen, and, and uh, another commander comes in to train him, and he's kind of kicked out, basically. But here's the funny thing. Tom Cruise, being an independently-minded person, a maverick, right, he goes and commandeers a, a, a fighter jet and takes off and begins to uh, prove that this mission can be done in the time that it needs to be done in. 
that's how you know it's a movie because you ain't going and stealing a jet. Okay? <laughs> that ain't going to happen. I don't care who you are. Okay? But anyway, all of the students are in this flight classroom and the, the new commander is there and comes on the radio that he's commandeered this plane basically and he's going to fly this, this practice mission to prove that it could be done. And so he goes and he flies this mission and proves that not only can it be done, but that it can be done 45 seconds faster than what they were trying to train the pilots to do it by. Okay? Uh, so, so why did I share that with you? Well, because John, I believe, kind of fits into the maverick thought process. Why do I say that? Well, the definition of maverick is independently minded. Independently minded. If you look at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books in your New Testament, if you look at those Gospels, the first three books, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are all three similar. As a matter of fact, they're called the Synoptic Gospels. Synoptic meaning similar. As a matter of fact, if you study them very closely, you will see that roughly about 80 Seven to 90% of the Gospels is repeated in those three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So they're similar. Now, granted, each one of those authors were inspired by God. The Word was inspired by God. The, the, <clears throat> the Word was, uh, was, uh, had all the authority and power of God before they ever even penned it. Um, but each one of them was writing to a different audience. John, the maverick John, is just the opposite. Where up to 90% of the synoptics is similar, in John's gospel, 90% of his is different than the other three gospels. Which is, which is very uh, uh, independently minded thinking. God, in other words, desired to speak through John in such a way that he would shed light more on, on Jesus and the deity and the, and the life saving of Jesus and eternal life than anything else. Now, does that mean that the other Gospels don't do that? No, it doesn't. They do. John just brings it to us in a different direction from a different vantage point. So, John, again, who was he? Well, he was most certainly a Jew. Don't get shocked. Jesus was a Jew, right? Uh, so, so that shouldn't shock you. If it does, well, let's need, let me need to study some church history and we'll get you up to speed on that, okay? Uh, but anyway, John was a, a, a Jewish man and and ultimately, he followed in the footsteps. He was called by Jesus, followed in the footsteps of Jesus. Uh, he was a disciple of Jesus. What is a disciple? A disciple is someone that is a, a student, for lack of better words, of a teacher. Okay? We say here at Virginia Hill Baptist Church, our mission uh, is to make disciples that make disciples. In other words... It's more than just living life with one another. As awesome as that is, and that is part of it, but it's more than that. It's, it's studying the Word of God together. It's, it's praying together. It's growing more into the image of Christ together. And that's what John was with Jesus. Every day that John got to spend with Jesus, he was growing more into the image of Christ. And as he grew more into the image of Christ, he became one of the inner circle. And in becoming one of the inner circle, he then ultimately had a mission uh, just like all the other apostles did. Uh, John <clears throat> is, known at, is known as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Excuse me, sorry. The disciple whom Jesus loved. You see that in John 13, verse 23. <clears throat> and by the way, if you're a note taker, I'm going to be trying to 
give you uh, different text or different verses to go through to authenticate what you're hearing today because I don't ever want you to take my word for it. All right? Uh, John and his older brother James were known as the sons of Zebedee. You can learn that in uh, Matthew 10, 2 through 4. Uh, but we're also referred to as the sons of thunder. I love that. The sons of thunder. You know, Jesus gives people names sometimes, right? And, and he named John and James the sons of thunder. And if you study your Bible leading up to that, there's really no indication as to why Jesus would call them sons of thunder from our perspective. But from Jesus' perspective, he knew exactly who they were. And he knew that there would become a point when sons of thunder would fit their personality perfectly. Right? Some of us in here, we might fall under the category of sons of thunder from time to time. Right? Um, you don't have to agree, I know. So. Uh, but but uh, as we think about that, and as, 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 as we think about John's gospel, John's gospel is filled with love and compassion to the point when you read the book of John, it, it's almost as if you could see John weeping as he was writing because of the desire to see people come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. I think that's a, a beautiful, beautiful thing. Uh, and it's, a, it's obviously a transformation that can only be done by God. I mentioned if you were here for Sunday school earlier, uh, Angela can testify as we've just celebrated uh, our anniversary. Angela can testify that, that who I am in Christ today looks radically different than who I was in Christ 19 years years ago, almost 20 years ago that we've known each other. Um, and she can testify to that. John here, as he lived with Jesus day after day after day, walked with Jesus day after day after day, his heart was transformed. And then that transforming of his heart, he became more of the image of Christ. So we know that in uh, Mark 3, 17, uh, Jesus gives John and James uh, the name Sons of Thunder. But why? Why? Well, if you turn over to the Gospel of Luke and you look in Luke chapter 9, there's a little paragraph in there. And in that little paragraph in there, uh, the, the idea of sons of thunder becomes rushing forward. You see, Jesus had sent some people ahead as he was on his way to Jerusalem, had sent some people ahead uh, to, 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 to prepare a place for them. And, and so, so as, as they enter into Samaria, the people of Samaria rejected Jesus because of where he was journeying to. They didn't want to have anything to do with him. They was turning away from him. They weren't allowing uh, them to, to find uh, a place to stay and a place to, to hang out there. And, and then we see this. James and John say, do you want us to call thunder down upon them? In other words, hey, they ain't going to take care of you. Let us go ahead and bring thunder down on them. We're angry. We're mad. So though we didn't know back in Mark why Jesus would give them the names sons of thunder, we learn in Luke that the reason he gave them that name is because they're short-fused, hot-tempered young guys they want to call thunder down on somebody the moment they're rejected. So to go from that to a book as beautiful as John and, and a book filled with just extravagant love is, is 
really quite amazing. Another little note about <clears throat> James and John, and you should know this because you're very proficient in the book of Acts because we swam in that book uh, for a year, a little over a year and a half. But in Acts chapter 12, verse 2, we know that James becomes the first apostle, first disciple that's killed. Herod the Great kills him with the sword. And in that text, we see when Herod kills him with the sword, he saw that it, the people liked that so much that then he took Peter captive and put him in prison with the intention to kill him as well. So James, John's brother, becomes the first uh, disciple killed. John is the last of the disciples to, to die. And ultimately, he dies from old age. Right? They tried to kill him, and it didn't work, so they put him on the island of Patmos. And when they put him on the island of Patmos, I believe that's when he probably wrote uh, the book of Revelation. Okay, And in writing the book of Revelation, uh, he, he finished that work, and then sometime after that, he died. He died of old age. So interestingly enough, the John that we're talking about, the Apostle John, <clears throat> the disciple whom Jesus loved, the author of the book of the Gospel of John, was the longest living disciple when his brother was the shortest living disciple. Most Bible scholars and church historians are comfortable with John as the author of his book, as I am as well. Some of the earliest church fathers seem certain that John was the author, which was why it was accepted so easily into the canon of the New Testament. What is the canon of the New Testament? The canon of the New Testament is the uh, 27 books in the New Testament that were received into the New Testament as God's authoritative word to us. Interestingly enough, if you go into your Bible and you look in there, you will find that nowhere in the Bible does God say these 39 books from the Old Testament and these 27 books from the New Testament are the books that are going to go in there. No, he inspires the early church fathers to determine and gives them a way to, to determine the authenticity of these books that make up our Bible today. Make no mistake, it is a divinely inspired work of God and God alone. Man just surrenders to, and interestingly enough, totally opposite of what we saw in our Bible study this morning, men surrender to the authoritative leadership of our Heavenly Father God and did what, he, what they were supposed to do. So John is an awesome book. John is an awesome guy, and I could ramble on about John for hours. Uh, however, I'm not going to do that because we got a couple other points that i got to make, and we're liable to not get done in time anyway. So there you go. So that's who John is, and we're going to learn more about who John is as we go along. Uh, but what was the purpose of John's gospel? That's your second point. What was the purpose of John's gospel? Well, unlike the synoptic gospels, John's purpose is not to present a chronological narrative of the life of Jesus Christ, but to display his deity. John writes to provoke faith in Jesus, resulting in eternal life. If you look at verse 31, which I read earlier, in these four little words that say, that you may believe that you may believe. That's the whole purpose of the Gospel of John wrapped up in one simple little thesis statement there that we may believe. Okay? Could also be, that we may believe, could also be translated that we continue believing, that we continue to walk in obedience with the Lord, that we continue to study the word of God, that we continue to pray, that we continue to build one another up. You, you do realize that that's what we do here, right? That's what the 
church exists for. To build one another up more into the image of Christ, but then ultimately to spread the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. In thinking about that, I want you to think about this. Uh, if, if John writes, uh, but these words are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name, then we must assume then, and shouldn't assume, but should take it on authority, that our responsibility mirrors John's responsibility. That we may lead others so that they may believe. Okay? So that they may believe. So who was John's audience? And this is what I found very interesting and, and exciting because God is always awesome like that. If you were here for the Sunday school class this morning, you got a Sunday school book. If you weren't here and didn't get one and you want one, you're welcome to one. I got one for everybody. But in the front of that book is, is what we call hermeneutics, right? And it lays out how you look at a text, how you study a text, how you take apart a text. And one of the things that we do in that is, is we want to look at who was the original audience that, 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 that John would have been writing this letter to. Who were those people? And in John's time, there was two primary audiences that he was writing to. He was writing to the false teachers that were beginning to come up in the church, people that weren't teaching that Jesus was the Messiah, people that weren't leading people according to the way of the Lord, people that were distracting or, 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 or for lack of better words, changing the gospel to fit their own agenda instead of uh, continuing to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ that provides for us the ability to seek and save or be the vessels that he uses to seek and save the lost. But then secondly, he was, he was proclaiming this gospel and his audience was unbelieving Jews. Unbelieving Jews. And so I want you to think about that. You know, uh, as mentioned several times and probably will be several more times <clears throat> when Angela and I was in Jerusalem and we were in that city and in that community there is an abundance of Jewish people there and here's the interesting thing about that there is literally a small uh, portion of Jewish people that are Messianic Jews they're Jews that believe in Jesus Christ but the vast majority of them do not. They reject the gospel. They reject that Jesus is the Messiah. They're still waiting for the first advent of Jesus, uh, the first uh, 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 Savior, this kingship, lordship, I don't know, mighty warrior that they're looking for. They're still waiting for him to arrive. And so they only generally take the first five books of the Bible as authoritative teaching. There's a problem there. And the problem is, is that in the Holy Land, the place that Jesus has chosen, the people that Jesus originally, or that God originally chose, they're on the fast track to the highway of hell. So let me say this. Evangelism doesn't stop at the borders of Texas. It doesn't stop at the borders of the seas that surround the United States of America. No. The gospel goes to the other most, most parts of the earth. So here's the deal. You could literally, and I saw this happening while I was there, literally be standing at the wailing wall and share the gospel with a multitude of non-believers who are, by all rights, very, very religious people. Why do I make that point? I make that point for this reason. Beloved, religion doesn't get you to heaven. Salvation in Jesus Christ is the only way to eternal life. Religion, no matter how religious you are, doesn't get you to heaven. 
Unfortunately, if, if things came to an end today, many people would be left behind right there at the well and wall and throughout the rest of the world. And those people would enter into, ultimately, after they stood on trial before Jesus, would ultimately enter into the pit of fire. So John's gospel, so John is, is preaching against the false teachers that are rising up in the church, which, by the way, we have those in church today. Uh, in the five and a half, almost six years that I've been here, <clears throat> we had an individual that kept on trying to promote some propaganda within this campus that was against what the teaching of, of this campus stood for, and ultimately that had to become, uh, had, to, had to be ceased, had to stop. Could not allow that to happen. Hence, everything that we teach here and everything that we do here goes through that office. And we verify whether or not this is accurate, whether or not it is viable, before we ever present it to you to be taught or to be studied. Therefore, if you're in a Sunday school class or a Bible study class or, or a discipleship class, or anything like that. It doesn't matter whether it's me teaching or it's John teaching. I can guarantee you that it comes with authority from God, not from us. And we're teaching you that because we want you to know the truth. So, that's the purpose of John's gospel. So John's gospel then is broken up into four different parts. There is the epilogue. That's the beginning. It's John 1:1 1, 1 through John John 1:1 1, 1 through 1 uh, through 18. John 1 verse 1 through verse 18. That's the prologue. And then the 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 the, the center of the book, uh, the main body of the book is broken up into two parts from John 1:19 to John 12:4. 50 is what's known as the signs. We see a lot of signs that Jesus does in that section of the book. And then from uh, John 13, 1 through the end, of, or through John 20, 31, which is the verse that we read today, is what's known as the book of glory, book of salvation. This is where we see Jesus and in, his, in all of his glory. And then the, uh, and then chapter 21 is the conclusion. It's the epilogue. Interestingly enough, when I was in school, John was in school, many of y'all been in school and you had to write papers, you had to give your thesis statement, right? And, and, and that thesis statement came in the first paragraph of your paper, there's a general rule in our school, it had to be in the first uh, paragraph, okay? And in your thesis statement was what the rest of your paper was built on. That was what either you were arguing for or arguing against through the rest of the paper. And then at the conclusion of your paper, you would basically circle it back to your thesis statement and finish your paper with a, with a, 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 a sense of that statement. John, interestingly enough, gives us 20 chapters and 30 verses before he gives us his thesis statement. And his thesis statement is what I read to you earlier, just for uh, reader's sake. I'm going to read it again. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Considering all of that, John is the only one of the Gospels that contains a precise thesis statement. But not only that, John's Gospel is, is, is a great apologetic word of God as well as a great evangelistic word of God. <clears throat> I would step out in faith and say this. If you memorized the book of John, kind of like I had y'all memorize the Sermon on the Mount, so I know all of you can recite that now. Um, 
but if you, <laughs> if you, if you memorize the book of John and, and you were out witnessing or sharing the gospel with somebody, John provides in, in his writing here a great apologetics. Apologetics meaning defense against other religions. Okay? Not only that, he presents for you an evangelistic presentation. Uh, why do I say that? Well, for this reason, uh, anybody here, and I want to see a show of hands. No, scratch that. I don't want to see your hands. I want you to say it with me. Ready? Anybody know this verse, John 3.16? Say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him would not perish but have eternal life. Look, every one of you is an evangelist. And you didn't even know it. My goodness. John's book is as much apologetic as it is evangelistic. Okay? And, 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 and we need to take these things into consideration when we're studying a book. That's why we want to do the hermeneutics in it. That's why we want, we want to know who the original audience was. We want to know how it applies to us today. We want to be able to cross that bridge in time from 2,000 years ago to now and say this applies to us today just as much as it did the day John penned it. That's what the Word of God is all about. So, considering all of that, John presents Jesus in his true identity. He presents him as incarnate. What does that mean? That means in flesh. The word incarnate means in fleshly form. He presents him as the Messiah. Uh, and the Savior of the world. To that end, John repeatedly stresses Jesus' miraculous signs, including eight specific ones. I'm going to share these with you very quickly. Uh, let me see. Turning water into wine. Healing a royal official. I was going to give you all the texts. You can get them from me later because I'm running out of time. Uh, healing a royal official, healing a lame man at the pool of Bethesda, feeding 5,000, walking on water, healing a, 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 a man born blind, rising Lazarus from the dead, and providing a miraculous catch of 153 fish. So most commentators would tell you that John actually presents seven signs. I'm not most. So I'm a little bit of a maverick myself. So I give you eight signs. Why? Because look here, I've gone fishing before. Right? And you out on a boat all night long and you don't catch anything. And even better yet, you done paid somebody $1,000 to take you out on that boat all night long and you didn't catch something. They're supposed to be a professional fisherman. Well, I can assure you of this. If we pulled back into the dock, and a man was standing there on the dock, and he says, did you catch anything? He said, no, not a thing, not even a return of my money because we didn't catch anything. And he says, well, just throw your hook out on the other side, and all of a sudden we snatch up 153 fish. Well, I don't know about you, but to me, that's a pretty miraculous sign. I believe that the apostles would have thought that was a pretty miraculous sign, too. That's me and my argument for that eighth one. Okay? But there's one even better than that. What about this? And I mentioned this just briefly in the Sunday school class, but, but what about this? The most authentic sign that anybody in the world on the planet that's ever lived or ever will live has is this. And I have seen it myself. In the garden tomb where they believed that Jesus was, was, was crucified and placed into the tomb. When you go inside that tomb, because uh, yes, it is empty. But when you go inside that tomb, when you turn around to walk out, there is a little sign above the door that I don't know who put there. 
but it says he's not here. And you know why it says he's not here? Because he's not. He got up and walked out. And not only did he get up and walked out, it was witnessed by hundreds of people. And then ultimately, he ascended to the right hand of the Father so you and I could sit here and talk about him when we're talking about the Gospel of John. So what's the connections? How does the Old Testament connect with the New Testament? Well, in our journey, we're going to see many places uh, where things connect. For example, uh, the I Am statements. You know in the Old Testament, Jesus or Moses asked Jesus, what do I say to Pharaoh when I go to him? Who do I tell him sent me? And, and God says, tell him I am sent you. I am that I am. I am God. I am Elohim. I am Yahweh. I am. Jesus connects himself. I am statements in the New Testament. He says, I am the bread of life. We think about the bread of life. God provided bread from, from heaven, uh, manna from heaven to feed the Israelites. Right? When we think about Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. The same light God promised to his people in the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah. Right? Jesus says, I am over and over again. He says, I am the good shepherd. I am the door of the sheep. But these three, you know better than any. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he says, I am the true vine, and you and I were the branches. Jesus is God incarnate, God in flesh. And John, John presents him that way to us. So your third point then is this practical application. How do we apply that? into our life today? <coughs> well, I'm glad you asked that question. Glad you asked that question. The Gospel of John contains, uh, continues to fulfill its purpose of evangelizing the lost. You know, because you all just realized that you graduated into evangelism. Right? By knowing John 3.16. It is also used as an evangelistic Bible study. We teach it a lot Oh, apparently somebody does, but not me, teaches it a lot <clears throat> to, to disciple others. Okay? So, so John's gospel continues uh, to be fulfilled even today. And, and not only that, but in John's gospel, Jesus teaches us how to do evangelism. You know, when, when he meets Nicodemus or when he meets the, the woman at the well, what does he do? He presents to them the saving grace that only Jesus can give. But watch this. Jesus met them where they were at. He went to them. So, beloved, I know that everybody in here is not called to evangelism. You've made that clear. But I'm telling you that Jesus has you put you on a mission and you have a responsibility. If you don't believe me, you can be angry with me all you want. But take it up with Jesus. Okay? So here's the thing. God gave you your testimony because you're going to encounter somebody right where they're at and they're going to need to hear your story. My story won't help them. Your friend that goes to another church's story won't help them. Only your story. That's why God gave you your story. So don't muzzle what God has graciously given you to do and that is to share the love of Jesus Christ God is a hunger or Jesus is and John presents this to us Jesus is a hundred percent man and he is a hundred percent God let me illustrate this to you real quick my name 
in case you don't know it, is James Clayton Cox. I was born April 23, 1965, All Saints Hospital in Fort Worth, Texas. I am as Texan as Texan gets. My dad was a military officer and I traveled all around the world. I turned 18 years old and I made a beeline back to Texas as fast as I could get here and I ain't left since. Okay? So I am 100% Texas, but Texan, but let me tell you this. I live in the United States of America. So at the exact same time that I'm 100% Texan, I am a 100% authentic, born and bred American citizen. So I am... Not 100 plus 100 makes 200. No, I'm 100 plus 100 that makes 100. I am an American Texan. Jesus is 100% God, 100% man as he's presented in John's gospel. And that does not add up to 200 something of something. It adds up to salvation in Jesus Christ the only person that could ever say that he is both man and God who came to save you and I. Amen? Amen. 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 So, beloved, look here. We're going to take this journey through John, and it's a beautiful book. I would encourage you to begin to read it now. And, and as you read it now... Uh, and start to study it now, maybe that prompts up within you some questions that you want to ask. And as you ask them questions, uh, then we're going to be able to sharpen one another, build one another up more into the image of Christ. And then finally, let me close with this. There is but one way to eternity in heaven, and that is through Jesus. And for Martha's sake, she's always worried about whether I'm going to fall off of this <laughs> stage. And apparently when I was practicing my sermon delivery this week, I must have said something that upset Jesus because I flung off of this stage. Now I got carpet burns on my knees because of it. <laughs> I ain't all kidding aside, praise God for today. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the wonderful book that you have given. Father, we thank you for your wonderful word and how it transforms our life. May your will be done through us in all that we do, Father. And as we prepare for uh, fall festival, as we prepare uh, for, for the school activities, as we prepare for all of the missional work that you've given us to do, Father, may you be glorified in what we do for you. For you. And we ask this through the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray.